Super volcanoes, alien invasions, the magnetic reversal of the poles, mass death and destruction caused by otherworldly beings, SCPs, and rogue suns or planets flying through space that just cruise by us, offset our orbit, and fling us out into space. There are many, many ideas that people have come up with as being the potential scenario for the end of humanity or our species or the planet. And there were quite a few of these iceberg lists that I found covering apocalypses or end of the world scenarios. But the one I ended up going with and the one I'll be using in this video is easily the best, most varied, most fun, in my opinion, iceberg. But I did also add in a few extra entries from either other icebergs or from my own research, as they weren't in this iceberg and they were just too fun and interesting not to include. And I'll also be covering how likely each one really is, and just precisely how much sleep you need to be losing over them. The first tiers start off pretty simply with scenarios and ideas that most people have heard of, but as we work our way down to the bottom tiers, Things just get weird, insane, and sometimes downright terrifying. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is honey and lemon tea with ginger, as if you couldn't tell, I am still a bit sick. And join me as we explore the ultimate apocalypse iceberg. So in the first tier, we have super volcano. So super volcanoes are basically the class of volcanoes that are the largest, most explosive ones that we know of. And a standard super volcano like Yellowstone has roughly a thousand times the explosive of power of, say, a volcano like Vesuvius, which you might recognize from all of these lovely paintings. Now, there are roughly 20 supervolcanoes that we know of, and an explosion by any one of these supervolcanoes would cause massive death and destruction. Almost immediately, within a few thousand kilometers, the magma and lava ejection would cause things to melt, it would cause fires everywhere, it would drown and suffocate people, but the explosion itself would also fire ash up into the atmosphere, causing a permanent, potentially worldwide dark darkness by blocking out the sun. This could cause a potential new ice age, it would cause plants and vegetation to die as they have no access to the sun, and when they die the things that eat the plants will die, and then the things that eat the things that eat the plants will die, and yeah, you get where this is going. So if one of these volcanoes goes off, or potentially another super volcano that we haven't tracked yet, and we're not incredibly well prepared for it, it could very well spell the end of humanity. But thankfully in the last 36 million years, there have only been about 30 of these eruptions, so they're not incredibly frequent. And let's just hope none of them go off anytime soon. Pandemic. So this one probably hits a little close to home for most of us after the last few years, but this would basically be a deadly disease that spreads throughout all of humanity, killing everyone off or at least enough people to end or stunt humanity. And while it does sound plausible and possible, it's not too likely that something like this would actually happen. Diseases normally, not always, tend to strike some sort of balance between transmissibility and mortality, in that the more transmissible they become, the less deadly they become. In order to keep their host alive, in order for that host to, you know, walk around and go on trains and cough on people, and to kind of promote and spread the disease. So it's not exactly in the disease's best interests, if you can even phrase it that way, to immediately kill everyone it comes into contact with. So it's very rare for a disease to spread like wildfire, be airborne, and be extremely deadly. It does happen, but it's rare. And there's of course always the chance to develop cures for it, develop treatments, and there always seems to be at least some people who are immune either from exposure or from just natural immunity. So this disease would have to be airborne, highly contagious, highly deadly, have no people who are immune to it in any way, and either act so fast that we can't develop a treatment or vaccine, or just somehow be immune to vaccines. So highly unlikely. But in all fairness, it doesn't even need to wipe out all of humanity. If you get a really bad one or a plague like the Black Death or something that wiped out a good majority of populations, then that could potentially set humanity back a decent chunk of time. Sun Death. So this one is kind of inevitable. In roughly two to three billion years, our sun will die. And when that happens, it will expand into a red giant and engulf the earth. Obviously, anything still on the earth at that time will not be too comfortable or happy. But as we learned from Thor, Asgard isn't a place, it's a people. So even if the Earth is engulfed and destroyed, if humanity can manage to, you know, explore space and find another habitable planet, Earth 2.0, then this shouldn't affect us too badly. And we have got at least 2 billion years to prepare. Global anarchy. Well, this is basically just what it says on the tin. The world gone mad. Imagine the banks collapse, resources are running out, wars start, eventually governments collapse, and it's every man or woman for themselves. Out there, 
in the apocalypse. There are a lot of entries on this list with this as the core idea, something massive that happens and just causes governments and society to collapse, but this I guess is just the base general concept of it. Deep Impact Event describes typically an asteroid or other celestial body smashing into the earth and causing an event on par with what wiped out the dinosaurs, if not worse. Now the effects of this would be much the same as a super volcano eruption, only potentially much more destructive depending on the size of the thing that hit us. A small to medium sized asteroid could cause years of darkness from when it hits the debris flying off into the atmosphere and then blocking the sun that way. And as we mentioned before, this could trigger a new ice age, completely destroy plants and vegetation and the ecosystem, so very not good. And if we are hit by something as large as a large moon or a planet, even a small moon actually would be quite devastating. It could just completely destroy the earth as we know it. The actual like core and the ball of the earth would likely survive, but our orbit would be shot off, the magnetic poles would be spinning around like crazy, which would likely destroy our atmosphere, our protection from solar rays, cause ridiculous amounts of tsunamis and earthquakes. It would basically just be like hell on earth until everything on it died and turned into fire and lava and dust, and then maybe maybe hopefully in a few million years we can somehow get life again but that's a big maybe so we really don't want another planet smashing into us real quick guys if you like and you subscribe then you join the tribe that was really fucking awful global warming so you may have heard about this pesky little devil in the last few years and that's because it is potentially very much a problem for earth now while some if not a lot of the climate change we experience is natural like earth does go through hot cycles cold cycles cycles, ice ages, the poles quite regularly in terms of the Earth's age tend to flip around and swap every now and then. So a lot of this does go on completely naturally, but there is some evidence to suggest that we are perhaps making things worse or putting our feet on the pedal sort of thing. But regardless of how it happens, natural or man-made, climate change seems to have the same destructive properties, at least to us and living beings. This means more intense storms and weather, rising temperatures, the melting of the polar cap, and rising sea levels. So if you want to imagine the outcome of climate change, just imagine the earth we all know and love, except just a little more angry. Nuclear warfare. Well, I just did a video on the fallout iceberg, so go check that out if you want to see what a post-apocalyptic wasteland might look like. And this one, to me, is probably one of the more likely ones on the list. We have a ton of nukes as a species. Well, I mean, we're the only species with nukes, as far as we know. I swear to God, if it's the fucking chipmunk, no, wasps. For sure that's why they're so mad and angry all the time. Because they have nukes to back it up. Guaranteed there's at least one nuke in the wasp population. I think they're just biding their time though. They don't want to reveal their hand too soon. But a lot of the ones we have now are way, way more powerful than any nukes we've used in the past. Like, for example, the ones we dropped in Japan. Like, those are weak compared to the ones we have nowadays. But we have gotten a lot better with our nuclear disarmament as well. At least compared to, like, the 80s. Basically every country, mostly Russia and America, was like, yo, let's just fucking chill, okay? Like, we don't need to be destroying the earth just yet. So everyone toned things down a little bit, and I think that's probably, in my opinion, for the good. But can you imagine the nukes of today's era, and the amount of them we have worldwide? Can you imagine that in, like, World War II? Like, you think the Germans would have surrendered without dropping nukes on, like, every fucking country in the world? It is kind of a scary idea, and it seems like we are probably just one bad decision away from a real-life fallout experience. And in my eyes, this is much more likely likely to be the cause for the end of the world, or humanity, rather than something like an asteroid or volcano. We are now onto the second tier, and we have an errant black hole. So an important bit of information on black holes. There tends to be one massive black hole, actually super massive, at the center of every galaxy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has one. Other galaxies that we can observe, like say the Andromeda, has one. And they act kind of like the sun in our solar system, with it in the center and everything else kind of orbiting around it. And there's this one one particular black hole known as Abel 2261, which belongs to a galaxy which is much, much larger than ours. And Abel is thought to be roughly two and a half thousand times the size of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And bear in mind, the one at the center of our galaxy is pretty fucking big. So to be two and a half thousand times that size, or that mass, is just 
fucking mind blowing. The only problem with this is that Able 2261 is nowhere to be found. It's not at the center of that galaxy that we mentioned, at least not in any visible sense, but theoretically it must exist. So where the hell is it? Either scientists suggest it was flung out of the galaxy by another black hole, as sometimes when two bodies are nearby and they're orbiting each other in some way, depending on their sizes and speed and a whole bunch of other things, they can either keep orbiting until they collapse into each other, or if one's kind of a bit off, it can end up actually flinging the other body out into anywhere. Whether that's into other planets, whether that's into another galaxy, or just out into the void of space. Or the other theory is that the black hole is just laying dormant, as maybe it's consumed all of the matter in its immediate area, so it is just basically invisible for now, waiting until it encounters something worthy of eating, and then maybe we'll be able to see it. Now the first possibility is what scientists fear the most. A super, super massive black hole just flying through space, possibly towards us. Us, 10 billion times the mass of our sun, mostly invisible and with absolutely no way of stopping it. Yeah, pretty fucking terrifying. And as for the likelihood, it's kind of hard to tell. You can't really give odds to something like this, as we don't really know enough about it. So it's basically impossible until it just happens, and then it'll honestly be way too late. I mean, not that we could have done anything about it in the first place, but it is a scary thought. Bonus entry, Andromeda. So this is one of those guaranteed but far off apocalypses, where in roughly 4.5 billion years, bear in mind the death of our sun will be about 2 billion years before this, so it's not like we'd be chilling on earth anyway, but in around 4.5 billion years, our galaxy, the Milky Way, will actually collide with another galaxy, Andromeda. I found these really cool images that show kind of the predicted progression of the collision, and of Andromeda getting closer and closer and closer closer to us until this gorgeous chaos happens, eventually leveling out into a sea of uniform brightness. But funnily enough, even though there are roughly a trillion stars in the Andromeda and roughly 300 billion stars in the Milky Way, the odds are that none of these stars will actually collide with one another. This is because the galaxies are so huge and the space between the stars is so great that it would be like our sun is this red berry here. I don't know if this shows up on camera, it's like a tiny red pea. But imagine this is our sun, and the next closest star is another red berry. But instead of being this far apart, the gap between these two is almost 700 miles. That's like almost the width of Texas. So most of what makes up the galaxy's size is just empty space. And as I said, the odds of any stars in either galaxy actually colliding is very slim. But some stars will likely be affected by the gravity of others, and be slim slingshotted out into space or off into another galaxy. Really crazy stuff, but pretty cool. And as I said, this will be long after the death of our sun, so we shouldn't need to worry about it too much. Super solar flare. So a solar flare is basically an electromagnetic explosion or outburst from a star like our sun. Magnetic energy gets stored in the sun's atmosphere until it builds up and explodes. <laughs> These genuinely look quite pretty, but the size and scales of the ones that we are currently experiencing rarely affect Earth in any major way, apart from stuff like occasionally interfering with radio signals. But a large enough solar flare could easily act like a giant EMP, basically wiping out all electronics on Earth and sending us back to the Stone Age, essentially. Lights would go off, electric gates and doors would open, a lot of tech that the hospitals use would largely be rendered useless, water filtration systems would stop working, communication would be like totally dead, except for like messenger pigeons or something. And all of this from simply a lack of electricity. And all of that can come from a single, random, extra large solar flare. Megafauna. So the term megafauna basically means large animal and often refers to animals that weigh a ton or more, like rhinos, giraffes, and elephants. But the term can be used to refer to even larger, more extinct animals. Like for instance, woolly mammoths. Huge fuckers. But also the Deodon, the Gigantopithecus, the Diprotodon, and the Argentivus. Now, these creatures are all pretty fucking cool, but I think we'd honestly be able to handle them if they suddenly resurfaced somehow. So, what I think this entry is likely referring to is large, large creatures, like for instance Godzilla or King Kong, who might have thick skin or scales, giant claws, and might be immune to bombs, rockets, 
gunfire and potentially come up from the depths of the ocean, which as we all know by now is a fucking terrifying place, to completely destroy our civilization. Now one or two of these we might be able to handle, but can you imagine 10,000 Godzillas all waking up at once and walking into our cities? Yeah, we would have no chance. I fucking knew the ocean would be the death of us. The Grey Goo scenario. So this is a somewhat terrifying one. The idea is that sometime in the future, humans create a relatively simple AI technology for one purpose, to convert organic matter into inorganic matter, which might be kind of useful when you think about it. You know, turn that useless grass over there that's not really doing anything into metals, into plastics, you know, things we can use to actually build stuff. And for efficiency in this scenario, the AI is programmed to convert, say, grass into metal and plastic, and then use the metal and plastic that it's generated to build new nanobots. So it basically multiplies itself indefinitely, and this is where our doom begins. If this is set into motion, it will convert more and more and more things, and create more and more nanobots, that eventually, and rather quickly, the entire Earth will be completely devoid of organic matter, and it'll just be made up entirely of nanobots. So, yeah, pretty scary one, and it could potentially happen if science maybe goes a bit too far, but thankfully I don't think we're quite there yet. Zombie Apocalypse. So this one is obviously quite well known, and it's been done in many, many creative ways throughout the years, especially in popular media. The classic form of this is like religious or demonic, of a dead body being possessed and literally rising from the grave, coming to attack regular folk like you and I. But since then, there have been a ton of variations on the idea. Yeah. that range from stuff like mind viruses or a type of human rabies and the effectiveness and abilities of these zombies varies from version to version as well some are fast some are smart some are dumb and slow some are strangely strong some of them only want to eat brains some will eat any type of flesh some don't even want to eat you they just want to like attack you and destroy as many things as possible and in some versions you actually need to be bitten to spread the virus while in others you can just have like contact like a bit of blood drop on you or something. It's an incredibly fun, if you can use that word, and classic one, which is probably why it's been done so many times over the years. But the odds of it actually occurring are, from what I can tell, very low. And if it does end up happening, I guess just binge all of the zombie films you can get your hands on, and try your best to stay safe in the upcoming zombie apocalypse. Rogue Planet. So this one was wild to me. Rogue Planets, also termed Nomad Planets, Orphan Planets, Starless, Unbound, Wandering, are planets that don't belong to any star system. They likely became rogue after being flung out from a star system, or they simply formed without a star system to begin with. The Milky Way alone is thought to have billions to trillions of these rogue planets, which, Jesus Christ. And the idea, the theory of one of these planets hurtling towards us, and either colliding with our Earth directly, which would basically just destroy the planet, or more likely narrowly missing us, but in passing so close to us, actually slingshotting us out of orbit and into the void of space, where we would obviously freeze to death in the complete darkness, then probably becoming a rogue planet ourselves. Yeah, I don't really know which option is more terrifying. And as with a lot of space ones, this one is unlikely likely until it actually happens, as it is kind of hard to tell exactly what's coming at us from outer space, and if it were something as large as a planet, we would have realistically no proper way of stopping the planet or moving our orbit in any substantial way, but maybe we'd come up with something. I like to think that we would. Alien Invasion. Ah, the best entry in the world. So as with zombies, aliens has always been a popular idea to play around with, especially in stuff like media. Super advanced beings from another planet, perhaps on the far side of the universe, who run all of their equipment and energy off of blueberries. And lo and behold, we are the only planet for miles around who have blueberries. There ain't no blueberries on Mars. So they come down here, kill every everyone take all of our blueberry stock and just basically take over the earth. That's the rough idea anyway. I might be threading in a bit of my madness there. Obviously there are a ton of variations on this one. The aliens could be humanoid like us. They could be completely different to us like fucking antinoid and antinoid. I don't know just giant like ant aliens. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. They could be friendly, hostile, carbon based, flat, super tall, skinny, wide. We have no idea. We haven't even found any life on any planet yet besides Earth. 
So maybe aliens don't exist? I mean, obviously not, because if aliens didn't exist, then who wrote this sick piece of music? Because it sure as hell wasn't humans. But with all the media attention those whistleblowers are getting lately, the idea of aliens is becoming, I guess, more and more popular. And this is one of the ones that we can't really predict or estimate, as if and when it happens, it just happens. If whatever species is able to travel space across these vast distances, when we're barely able to make it to the fucking moon, if they're able to do this, they will clearly possess immensely more technology and would likely have developed those stereotypical little ray guns that just shoot out green lasers and turn people into goo or ash or dust or something. But we would be massively outgunned and if they wanted to, that would likely be the end of humanity and the start of alien manatee. Gamma ray burst. So I covered this one in my space iceberg a while back, but these are basically these huge, gorgeous, violent explosions that send out mass amounts of gamma rays and that are described by NASA as the most powerful class of explosion in the universe. These are thought to happen when the death of a giant, giant star occurs, and these were first detected hilariously when US satellites were sent above the atmosphere in order to detect secret Soviet nuclear tests that were being done down in Russia. And while they were up there above the atmosphere, they ended up detecting these giant bursts of gamma rays. As we couldn't detect them before this, as our atmosphere actually deflected and absorbed pretty much all of these rays, which is fantastic because this protects us. But if for whatever reason, say our atmosphere weakened, or if these gamma ray bursts were extra large or extra close to us and were able to just force their way through the atmosphere, the radiation would likely wipe out all all life on Earth, or at least on the side of the planet that it actually hits. Very deadly, very dangerous stuff. So just thank your lucky socks that we have an atmosphere. AI revolution. Once again, one that's quite close to home for a lot of us in the recent years. Imagine a world where AI advances to the point of predicting everything we need before we need it. Now I know adverts kind of do this already in a way, but imagine your fridge just ordering food that it thinks you'll need and want, of the TV or YouTube or what have you, predicting exactly what show or content would make us happiest, and then basically forcing us to watch it. And what happens when they start drafting legal documents, as they know the law better than us, and start handing out sentences to criminals, as they would know the exact odds of someone reoffending, and then they start to write laws on perhaps the perfect way to run society. Then what happens if this all gets a bit too much for us, and we move to turn the AI off? The AI may very well end humanity to save itself, and this is what the AI revolution might look like. Eventually, instead of working for us, they work for their own benefit and survival. And humanity at this point is just an annoying bug on the earth that will be crushed by these robotic overlords. It's certainly possible as an outcome, it's not very bright or cheery, but it is one reason why advancements in AI need to be monitored quite carefully, quite closely, and have, in my opinion, many, many safeguards put in, especially physical safeguards, like for instance, unplugging your computer from the wall, where nothing in any computer program on any PC can actually prevent you from pulling the plug out of the Wall, but all it takes is for us to go a little too far with progress and for one hyper intelligent AI to be developed and given power, and it could very well be the end of humanity. Internet collapse. The idea behind this one is that we use the internet for pretty much everything. We use it for communications, for security, for defense, for medical and hygiene systems like hospitals and water purification centers. So, if for whatever reason the internet were to completely fail and collapse, that may very well be enough to send us into a complete panic, spelling the end of society and humanity as we know it. And I also couldn't put this video out to you guys, so that would majorly suck. Incidental asteroid redirection. So this one has kind of a dark, ironic humor to it. The idea is that in the future, when our space tech is sufficiently advanced, we might fly out to a passing space rock to, you know, drill down, harvest some resources from it. And in attempting to make the harvest, we accidentally actually nudge the space rock into a direct collision with the Earth, resulting in 
yeah, all the things we touched on earlier. Ice Age, Eternal Darkness, Mass Extinction, Death and Destruction of All Life on Earth, just the, the regular stuff. It's certainly possible, I mean, in the future, and knowing just how goofy humans are, I think it's absolutely possible that something like this could eventually happen. The second coming is straight from the Bible, and it is often confused or conflated with another entry in the next tier, the Rapture. So to avoid confusion, we will discuss both of them together in the next tier. Bonus entry, Ragnarok. So Ragnarok has become popularized obviously through the MCU and Thor, but it originates as a traditional Norse tale or myth in which there are a massive series of natural disasters, including the burning of the entire world, and a great battle of the gods in which a bunch of the gods actually die, including Odin, Thor, Loki, Heimdall, Freya, and Tyr. Then the entire world is submerged underwater, and after all these events, the world rises again, cleansed and fertile with the surviving gods meeting and the world being repopulated by the two remaining humans Leif and Leif Frausia by hiding in the wood of Hodmimis Holt and consuming the morning dew as food which Okay. But it is thought by many scholars that Hod Mimis Holt shouldn't be thought of as a literal woods or forest or anything like that, but as an alternative name for Yggdrasil. So they hid in Yggdrasil and then after Ragnarok, they emerged from the tree and from them all of human life flourished. This kind of makes sense lore-wise, as it is apparently quite a common Germanic Norse idea for mankind to have originated from trees, and it is, at least in my opinion, a pretty cool story. Dinosaur Takeover. So think Jurassic Park, but on crack. Humans create these long extinct animals, who subsequently break out of their confines, continue to attack people and breed and multiply, and eventually dethrone humans and take over as the dominant species. This one isn't honestly completely out of the question. I mean, we have been doing some major work with various species, especially with extinct species in trying to bring them back from eggs and DNA samples, that sort of thing. So it wouldn't be completely absurd to imagine we might get a Jurassic Park type of scenario. And from there, if we're irresponsible with it and we let some loose and they start to breed and multiply, and then we have thousands or millions of T-Rexes and Spinosauruses and Leptictidiums running around. I mean, those last ones are more cute than scary. But T-Rexes everywhere eating out dogs and grandmas, yeah, that wouldn't be very pleasant, and may genuinely cause enough destruction and chaos and mayhem, especially if we weren't able to fight back, to push us basically back to the Stone Age. The question is, which I sometimes like to think about, would we fare better or worse than we did in the Stone Age? Like, yeah, we are typically smarter now than we were back then, but we also don't have the stamina, we don't have the strength, we don't have the body fur or claws or anything that we had. I mean, not that we ever had, like, like giant fucking claws or anything. But you know, our nails were harder, we were more rough with things. So without all of our technology and current knowledge, do you think just our minds being smarter would be able to more quickly develop tools and strategies and perform better than we did back in the Stone Ages? I don't know, it's definitely food for thought. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Some scientists are so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they don't stop to think whether they should. Honestly, I love that film. Third tier, The Rapture. So in tier to we mentioned Jesus's second coming. The first coming was when he you know, came down to earth, did all the stuff that he did in the Bible, was born as baby Jesus, got crucified, etc. And then the rapture is supposed to occur, which happens instantly. It's where Jesus just basically comes down and zoops up all the believers into heaven. It can happen anytime and without warning, just whoop, and any believers in Christ who have already died will also be resurrected and brought up into heaven, even from like thousands of years ago. Then some end times sort of events will occur, kind of making earth a living hell, and then the second coming of Jesus will happen, with Jesus coming down to earth, removing all of the non-believers in judgment, defeating the Antichrist, and establishing a millennial kingdom. That's the idea anyway, and the likelihood of this one, I guess, depends on your beliefs. If you're non-Christian, you likely believe this is impossible and just maybe mumbo-jumbo, but if you're Christian, you're likely to believe this is literally, if not at least metaphorically, true. And Speaking of religious raptures, we have bonus entry Kimaya, which is the Islamic Day of Reckoning, also known as the Promise and Threat, the Day of Resurrection or the Day of Religion, where all bodies will be resurrected from the dead and all people are called to account for their deeds and their faith during their lifetime. This honestly should appear 
probably slightly further down on the list, as I think unless you're a Muslim, you don't likely know of this, as opposed to, say, the rapture or the second coming of Christ, which I think is a little bit more well known, at least in the Western world. But I just thought it fitting to pair these two together, as they're both end of day judgments in Abrahamic religions, and they both have a fair few similarities. When they'll both occur is both only known to God, they'll both be announced by the call of a trumpet, they'll both be preceded by strange and terrible events, and Jesus will return to earth in both instances, albeit in different roles depending on which religion you belong to. And as I said before for likelihood of this happening, if you're a Muslim then this is probably an absolute certainty to you, but if you're not then this is closer to probably just make-believe. Simulation shutdown. So an interesting theory for existence has always been the simulation theory, namely that we are not living in a physical reality so to speak, but rather in a simulated one, kind of like a computer game or like the Matrix. And one somewhat convincing argument for this is an argument of chance. So if you take reality, like the physical reality, there's as far as we know only one physical reality. Then say you created an ultimate simulated reality and you weren't able to tell the difference between the two, any person that had a consciousness would in theory have like a 50-50 chance of actually being in the physical reality. You know, there's one simulated and one physical. I hope everyone is still with me on this. And since we can never add physical realities, but we could keep creating and adding virtual realities, you know, almost like running multiple instances of a video game on a computer or opening up multiple web browser tabs or something, you could in theory create millions or billions of these simulated realities. And then our 50-50 odds become more like one in a trillion that we are actually in the one physical real reality. So in theory, we are way, way more likely to actually be in a simulated reality than in a, you know, real physical one. And the argument is that this has already happened and that we are now currently living in a simulated reality, but we have no real way of telling. And simulation shutdown just refers to the simulation that we're in being turned off or shut down. Like perhaps they pull the computer from the wall or something or turn off the switch and instantly our entire universe is just like gone. And again, it's one of those types of things that's impossible until it happens, and since there's no real way of telling whether we're in a simulation or not, we may as well just not bother worrying about it. The Big Freeze. So you may have heard of this one being called by another name, the Heat Death of the Universe, and they're basically just different names for the same thing. So with the discovery of dark energy in 1998, we figured out that the universe was expanding farther and farther away at an increasing rate, and that things in the universe, planets, stars, galaxies mainly, were getting further and further away from each other. So what's the end result of this? Well, everything will get further and further away from each other. Eventually gas will be equally distributed in the universe, meaning that no new stars can form. As for stars to form, you need nebulae typically, which is just massive dense collections of gas that eventually come together and collapse under their own gravity and turn into what we have as stars. So if everything is perfectly spread out and there's no motion, there's no energy, everything is lifeless in the sense of actual life and in the sense of movement, then the universe will basically be like a snapshot, completely still and unchanging for the rest of time. Everything will sit just slightly above the coldest temperature possible, absolute zero, and that will be it. Pretty terrifying and a little depressing, and in my opinion one of the more scary ones on the list, especially considering that it's all based in science, and it's not really violent or aggressive, it's just slow, dying, cold and empty. <sighs> the big rip. Now I know that I've said before that the ocean is the most terrifying place, and I mean maybe it is, but space is definitely up there. Do you get it? up there. Okay, I'll see myself out. I always used to ask myself as a kid, what is outside of space? Like, if space is expanding, what are we expanding into? I always used to imagine, like, a brick wall around space. Like, and when you finally got to the furthest point in space, there was this giant, like, cartoon red brick wall blocking you, which is pretty fucking stupid, but as a kid, I didn't know any better. But then I thought, what's beyond that wall? Like, it can't be actual stuff, because then that would just be the 
universe. But then it can't also be the universe, because surely that part of the universe would need to have a border of some kind as well. And then the next obvious question is what's outside that border? Yeah, I had a strange childhood, but it is definitely something to think about if you want a ton of existential dread. But the big rip is another theory regarding space and the end of the universe, which says, basically, I won't confuse anyone with the minute details in this one, but it basically says that the universe is expanding faster and faster, and at some point this expansion will reach an infinite speed, at which point something happens and we don't really know what that something might be. It could rip apart the universe somehow, which is what the big rip theory proposes. It could, like a rubber band, somehow bounce back, which is what the big bounce proposes. Or maybe just the entire universe will cease to exist. We don't really know much about the end of the universe, obviously. We're just kind of running off theories. But I think that's part of what makes it actually so terrifying. Because it's not just planets or stars or galaxies. It's like actual existence itself. It's the same sort of thing as trying to imagine what was before the Big Bang, when apparently like energy, matter, time and all of that started at the Big Bang. So like you can't use the word before if you're referring to an existence without time, like that doesn't really make sense. And imagining existence before the Big Bang, you also wouldn't be able to imagine like matter or energy or anything like that. So it is honestly just a nutso idea. But sorry to scare you with once again space stuff. And speaking of space stuff, we have strangelets. So this is another topic that I covered in my space iceberg, so definitely check it out if you're into these sorts of things. But I'll try and summarize this one as it's a very complex topic. Basically, when a giant star dies, it sometimes collapses down from its giant size all the way to what's known as a neutron star. Now, these neutron stars are around one and a half times the mass of our sun, so that's their like weight or density sort of thing. But it's compressed all the way down to just six miles wide, which is just insane. Like, a single tablespoon of this star would weigh more than a billion tons, which is roughly the weight of Mount Everest, in a single tablespoon. Anyway, there's a special type of hypothetical neutron star that is even smaller and even more dense, and at the center of these stars is a hypothetical particle, and this special hypothetical particle is what makes up strangelets. I won't go into detail on this as it is quite confusing, but again, link to the space iceberg in the description. These strangelets are a special type of matter that when they come into contact with regular matter, like for instance everything on our earth, they instantly start converting it to strange matter. And then that new strange matter converts everything else into strange matter and you get like a massive domino effect. So one theory says that there are these strangelets, these microscopic strangelets, just flying through space. We have basically no way of detecting them, but if one of them happens to just hit into our earth, it could spread super super quickly quickly like a virus, basically converting every atom on Earth into strange matter. And needless to say, this would obviously kill everyone and everything, so yeah, pretty terrifying stuff. Bonus entry, Gliese 710. So we've covered rogue planets in this iceberg, but this is a rogue star. Just imagine an entire fucking star just flying through space doing whatever it is stars do. Consuming hydrogen, I guess. This sun is expected to pass by our solar system in around 1.3 million years, and while it won't necessarily come into our solar system and, like, smash into any of our planets, it may very well pass close enough to something called the Oort Cloud, again, something I covered in the space iceberg, which is this sphere, essentially, of massive chunks of rock and ice that was flung way, way out when the sun formed. And now it actually orbits the sun, but, like, way, way, way far out. Like thousands of times farther out than any of our planets are. Occasionally, it's theorized that a bunch of the comets and asteroids we experience have actually come from that Oort cloud, just flying in towards the center of the solar system. But it's thought that when this sun passes by, its gravity may very well slingshot a bunch of the comets and asteroids in towards the center of the solar system. So instead of getting, you know, a few minor comets and asteroids here and there, we might just be absolutely absolutely blasted with these. And if they're frequent and or large enough, that could make Earth a not very safe place to live. Rogue experiment. So basically this is the idea that humans are too smart for their own good, and we'll end up 
performing some experiment that just goes too far, whether that's creating a new deadly disease accidentally or on purpose, or creating zombies or a new species that wipes us out, or giant explosions or black holes or something. I think this is one of the more likely ones on the list, again because we are constantly tinkering around with stuff that we really don't know, and I understand we need to take risks in order to progress as a species, like I am totally down for experiments and taking risks, but that does leave open the possibility for creating mutant zombie squirrels, so I'm just saying be careful. Speaking of rogue experiments, we have a man-made black hole. So this is a theory that through some scientific shenanigans, perhaps something like the Large Hadron Collider, we inadvertently create a black hole. And interestingly enough, with the Large Hadron Collider, we essentially fire particles at each other at around 11 kilometers per hour slower than the speed of light, which is just bonkers. We observe these little collisions, hence the term collider, and we learn a clever little thing or two from it. But if we were to randomly create a black hole, even if we created one just like the size of a coin, a black hole this size would have just as much mass as the entire Earth. So it would either rip us to pieces, slingshot us off our orbit and into space, or increase the gravity on Earth to about a hundred times what it is now, which would basically just kill every living being on Earth. Or, more likely, it'll probably do all of the above. It would happen extremely quickly, it would be very destructive, and yeah, now this list is starting to freak me out a little bit. And I'll just say that not all of the entries are space themed. I promise there are some more varied ones in just a little bit. Time Paradox. This one is quite a fun one, and that's probably why it's been so widely explored in popular media, just like zombies and aliens. We're not really sure how time travel works, or if it's even really possible, but it is plausible that we'll invent time travel eventually, and if we do, Perhaps we just break the entire universe. Maybe we go back in time and prevent the time machine from ever being invented, which would create a paradox. And can paradoxes exist in this universe? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it'll create a multiverse timeline sort of deal. Or maybe as soon as we create the paradox, the entire universe will just cease to exist. Time travel at the moment is more science fiction than actual science. So I'll leave this one up to you guys. Vacuum decay. This one is quite complex, so I will simplify the whole thing. The idea is that the universe is an imperfect vacuum. So we all know space is a vacuum, and again, to simplify things, this means it kind of sucks things up into it. A vacuum kind of always wants to equalize its pressure with other things around it, which incidentally is how straws work. You create a vacuum with your mouth and the liquid just flows up into it. So the whole idea with vacuum decay is that the universe might somehow randomly develop the perfect vacuum state, which would suck all of the universe around it into itself, converting all of that into a perfect vacuum state. And then this vacuum would just spread throughout the entire universe, basically converting everything into this perfect vacuum. This would of course disrupt many, many things, push and pull things around, destroy things, so this would basically be the end of humanity. But as to when this will happen, or even if it's possible to happen, uh, we're not too sure on that one yet. Polar reversal. Polar reversal refers to our magnetic poles, north and south, with north then being on the bottom, and south then being on the top. This is something that happens fairly regularly on planet Earth, at an average rate of around once every 300 thousand years or so, but these aren't regularly spaced out, and there doesn't really seem to be a pattern for them. We have evidence of multiple flips happening in around 50,000 years, and we have evidence for huge periods of time, like 10 plus million years, with absolutely no flips happening. The last magnetic flip was over 700,000 years ago, so if you are a big believer in averages, we are a little overdue for one, but as I said, there have been time periods where it hasn't happened in 10 million years, so we honestly don't really know. During this flip, our magnetic fields would just go into pure chaos, and it would weaken our protection from deadly space radiation by as much as 90%. So a magnetic flip would not be a fun thing for us. It would ruin ecosystems, wipe out many species of migratory animals, like birds for example, likely destroy a lot of our electronics, and expose us to massive amounts of deadly space radiation. And as I said, there doesn't seem to be a really reliable way 
way to predict these flips but there is maybe some evidence to suggest that there is one starting really fucking soon and may have already actually started so yeah i love researching this iceberg totally not terrifying at all i'm not gonna get any sleep tonight the singularity the singularity describes a point in time in regards to how advanced our ai is and that doesn't make much sense but let me explain if the singularity is here while we currently are all the way back here just imagine this as a timeline then at this point here the ai doesn't really have much control maybe it's at the point that the ai currently is now for us where it's kind of clever it can kind of do things but if we ever really wanted to we could unplug the machines turn the computers off so it doesn't really have much power then when we're here maybe the ai has more power but we can still edit the code change the algorithms and slow down the learning and when it's here maybe sometime just before the singularity maybe we can't turn it off we can't change the algorithms it has control over some things but we can still you know have a nuclear option maybe even quite literally in terms of blowing up the mainframes or physically shutting down the ai in some way like there's always still a hope to maintain our power over humanity but once we reach here the singularity this is the point of no return perhaps the ai is now self-learning at a trillion times a second perhaps it's developed its own infinite energy source so there's no way of shutting it down and perhaps it now controls all of our nuclear codes so there's no possible way we can destroy it or blow it up after the point of the singularity that's when the ai basically wins it'll get progressively smarter and more advanced from there as it just teaches itself repeatedly every single day perhaps it'll just hook up all of our brains to a mainframe of some sort or a simulation and let us live like matrix style or perhaps it'll just wipe out all human life but whatever it decides the point is that humanity won't have a say in it and unsubscribe we've all got to do our bit chuck norris so a bit of a silly one to break up the string of technical sciencey entries i guess but chuck norris this guy is said to have one hell of a roundhouse kick there have been jokes and memes made about chuck norris since basically he started acting jokes about his strength and manliness but like absolutely insane jokes some of my favorites chuck norris doesn't read books he just stares them down until they give him the information he wants and there is no chin behind behind Chuck Norris's beard, just another fist. And when the boogeyman goes to sleep every night, he checks his closet for Chuck Norris. Some of the best classic jokes around to be sure, but this entry says that if Chuck Norris decided to roundhouse kick the world, that no one could stop him and life as we know it would cease to exist. The third impact. So this is a super interesting apocalypse scenario found in the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, or just Evangelion for short, or even just Eva to the diehard fans. In this anime, a spaceship containing seeds of life is sent out by this super advanced race and it collides with Earth creating life on Earth and humans, etc. But there was another form of life in another spaceship that was actually supposed to inhabit Earth, but they were never given the chance. So later down the line, there is a plan to get all of the humans, combine them all into a singularity, and free up the Earth for these other beings. And in doing so, they would also make humans perfect, essentially removing all of their flaws by introducing them to this singularity, which don't get it confused with the singularity from the last entry, by the way. I just realized they're both singularity but the last one was a point in time and this one is just all humans together as one being so as a singularity all humans together with no individual body name mind humans will be perfect and will do great apparently which doesn't sound too fun to me, but maybe I'm just not adventurous enough. So after this happens, one of the characters realizes that, hey, even though humanity is perfect in this form and is one with itself they accept that the difficulties of life the risk of being hurt of being flawed of basically being human is worth it for the chance to be an individual and to connect with other people and so the singularity is eventually reversed and all the people are turned into well people again bit of a wild one but it is kind of interesting nonetheless the fourth tier the anti-gods arrival so this is a scenario in which through no fault of our own but maybe through many faults of our own an interdimensional portal gets opened maybe someone drew a pentagram on the ground and performed a ritual because they thought it would be cool and it would impress their friend jeff but jeff was just like 
Eh? And that kind of annoyed us, and now we have an interdimensional portal in our living room. And from this portal, an interdimensional god comes out and wrecks havoc on the earth and on humanity. Not the biblical type of god, but imagine like Dormammu from Marvel sort of thing. Not very likely, but a fun and creative one to think about nonetheless. Core malfunction. So at the center of the earth, we have a solid core, and we have a liquid outer core around it. And then the rest is, you know, just the earth. These two cores spin at their own rates and speed, but what would happen if they were to malfunction and, say, stop spinning altogether? Well, if the inner core stopped spinning, it honestly wouldn't be that bad. The inner core actually changes speeds and directions quite frequently, every 20 years or so, but if it stopped, then the Earth may slow down a little bit. We may notice our days and nights getting longer. Nothing super major, but if the outer liquid core stopped spinning, that would be very, very bad. The tectonic plates would smash into each other, causing unbelievably large earthquakes, tsunamis, the Earth's magnetic field would be completely frizzled, and that would, as we mentioned before, cause us to all suffer from a major case of deadness, our atmosphere would get stripped away, and the solar winds would eventually cause us to lose a lot of the things we kind of like on the surface, like trees and greenery and water, and we would end up actually much like Mars, which actually used to be a lovely flourishing planet that was covered in water and potentially life? Yes, this Mars. And at the time, it is thought that Mars also had a liquid outer core, but when the liquid core solidified and stopped moving, this threw off Mars's magnetic field, which left it open to the solar winds, and slowly this stripped away all of Mars's atmosphere and water. A sad tale for sure, and it's one that could happen to us if our liquid core ever stopped spinning. Parasitic assimilation. So this one is super fucking creepy, and it's explored in various medias, such as the film Assimilation, or The Thing from 1982, or in stuff like the Mandela Catalog and Log Horror. The basic idea is that other beings take over humans and or pretend to be them. This can be done in a variety of ways, either from them being aliens, or them being creatures, or demons, or AI, or even old gods, and ranges from them actually killing the human being, to just cloning and imitating them, to maybe infecting them so they're still human, but their mind's a little bit warped. As I said, it's a very creepy idea and form of horror, I think, as it's a lot easier and more comfortable when you separate out the good from the evil. You know, it's like we're human, that's safe, that's good, that's comfortable, and our enemy is whatever's over there. Whether it's aliens or monsters, we know for certainty that we are humans and they are the bad guys. But with this scenario, you can't even trust your fellow humans, your friends, your colleagues, your mum, that one dodgy guy who's always borrowing money and never paying it back. Well, now you especially can't trust him, because not only will you never get that fiver back from him, but he'll also kill you and assimilate you into the hive mind. Not good. You can't even trust your closest allies, as now any one of them could be the enemy, and you also get into the uncanny valley type of territory, where things look and act almost human. Like, it's so close, they're so almost perfect, but there's just something off about them, and this is often scarier and creepier than like a full-blown horror or evil character. And because you can't trust anyone, you're also kind of alone now, which just adds to the terror. At least in regular horror, you can hang out with people, you can fight with them, at the end of the day you can all huddle together and make jokes, even while you're fighting the enemy. But with this, you have and can trust no one. And it's creepy as fuck, and it's honestly making me a little bit scared. This whole idea comes from stuff like the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which that took way too many times to say, which is a fungus which takes over an ant and turns it basically into a zombie. It slowly feeds on the ant's innards, then controls its body and make it climb up to a good vantage point, turns its head into a funnel essentially, and from there shoots out spores which float in the wind and go to infect other ants. And then the cycle continues. Fucking nightmare fuel. And also while researching this I saw some terrifying ideas for mermaids being parasites. The top half is the human and the bottom half is the parasite, so like the flipper side. According to this theory, mermaids lure humans in, they kill and eat the men, but for the young women, they take them underwater and attach a fresh parasite to their legs. This slowly consumes the legs and turns them into flippers, and then the parasite gains full control over the human, turning them into a mermaid. Pretty terrifying, but I think I've spent a little too long on this entry, so 
Moving on. Lunar impact. This describes the scenario of the moon getting closer and closer to the earth, which would disrupt our spin a little and throw off some of the lunar cycles. Pretty annoying, but not too destructive. But what if the moon's orbit slowly got closer and closer and closer until it actually crashed into the earth? Well, obviously that would be extremely fatal and would likely, if not definitely, destroy all life on earth. So we do not want that outcome. But thankfully the moon is actually moving away from us at a rate of around one inch per year, which admittedly is very slow, but at least it's moving in the right direction, away from us. Hell invasion. So what if Satan, the devil, gets sick of chilling in hell, pun absolutely intended, and he decides to come up here to earth, bring all of his hell buddies, and start a war on humanity. Well, this is what a hell invasion would entail. From all the ideas of hell and Satan and demons, we would likely be completely helpless against them, and would either need help from God or the angels, or a lot of nukes. And America's got a lot of guns, so they could potentially hold their own if needed? A shootout between Satan and your everyday Americans. That would honestly make for a great film, and it would be kind of hilarious if we actually won. Hostile Takeover is a very unique form of apocalypse. It describes something either like a cult of humans, or human-like creatures, with superior technology, strength, intellect, initiating a takeover of humanity and or the earth. Perhaps it's a group of humans who discover magic, or ancient powerful artifacts, Effects, or develop an insanely powerful, unstoppable weapon and take over Earth that way. It's a bit strange and it's not really like the Earth being destroyed, or even humanity being destroyed, but it's kind of like Earth being now under new leadership, which could spell the end for humanity as we know it. And it's a bit more political, I guess, than like an entire planet smashing into you. The Happening is a film by M. Night Shyamalan, so those are always a fantastic watch, in which humanity gets infected by a deadly plague. but this plague doesn't just kill you, it invades your mind and convinces you to do it on your own. I won't spoil the ending because I quite like the film, but this sort of thing is kind of similar to the ant fungus we discussed earlier, except with humans instead of ants, obviously, but it is some creepy stuff. Ultra Fauna. So we discussed the idea of mega fauna earlier, of like Godzilla-sized creatures coming from the ocean depths to destroy humanity, but Ultra Fauna describes even larger beings, perhaps coming from space, perhaps something like the size of Texas, or bigger, who knows, coming to Earth to wipe out all of humanity in one fell swoop, or swipe. <laughs> It's definitely a theory, and probably up there with Marvel level world building, but as of today there's no real evidence for giant space creatures, at least not yet. It is still pretty terrifying though. Cthulhu Awakens. <sighs> now this is a fun one to explore. I say fun, I mean existentially terrifying, tomato tomato, but Cthulhu is a creature, an otherworldly Lovecraftian cosmic entity, first introduced in the short story The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. Cthulhu is currently trapped, imprisoned, and even while imprisoned, just his mere existence in this universe is the source for the constant unconscious anxiety that every single human feels. The story goes that while Cthulhu is currently trapped, he will eventually make his return, and when he awakens, it won't be good for anyone. It is written that the time when Cthulhu awakens would be easy to know, for then mankind would have become as the great old ones, free and wild and beyond good and evil, with laws and morals thrown aside, and all men shouting and killing and reveling in joy. Then the liberated old ones would teach them new ways to shout and kill and revel and enjoy themselves, and all the earth would flame with a holocaust of ecstasy and freedom. And one reddit post describes what exactly might happen, from seconds after Cthulhu's return to days after, and it is quite detailed and an incredible read, which I'll leave a link to in the description below, but I will summarize it here. Within seconds to minutes, mass insanity starts, people muttering strange unknown languages, others peeling the skins off their faces, planes falling out of the sky, worldwide earthquakes. About 15 minutes in, there's a huge plague of insects, madness inducing gas, and people are driven mad at a maddening rate. After an hour, the laws of the universe and logic will start to change. People will start to see brand new types of primary colors. Unknown creatures will crawl out of graves, and animals 
animals worldwide would start to mutate into strange, horrific creatures. Within several hours, people who should be dead can't die and are forced to live, mostly in unbearable pain. The moons of many of our planets would crack open, and as black ooze pours out of them, massive earthquakes would shake the world, seemingly in rhythm, almost as if they were chanting in worship to Cthulhu. Within a day, buildings, woods, oceans, all natural landscape has mutated and transformed into a completely unrecognizable world. The moon would become blood red, portals to new rifts and dimensions would open up everywhere, and every human is either dead or completely gone mad. And within a week, everyone who remains will have melted minds that simply chant his name, his name, his name until they die. While these eerie black structures crash out of the ocean and tower miles up towards space. And that is the call of Cthulhu. So yeah, some insane stuff. A lot of people, myself included, before looking into this, think of Cthulhu kind of in line with something like Godzilla, like a giant physical creature that will just destroy cities and stuff. But really, the sanity of humankind depends on Cthulhu staying asleep. He is not just a creature, but he is an elder god, or cosmic evil as he's often been described. He doesn't need to see you or have any contact with you to affect you, he just is. And that would make for an absolutely terrifying, horrific, maddening end of days. Alternate humanity. Basically imagine the Loki series, and this is basically like our humanity, but from either a different dimension or a different timeline, comes to invade our timeline or dimension. And so we have a big interdimensional war. Just imagine like the Fallout universe coming to our universe and having some sort of war with it. Honestly hard to say who would win. But if this other humanity had for some reason developed better technologies, better weapons, better strategies, it could very well spell the end for our humanity. Fifth tier, tainted atmosphere. So this is in regards to our atmosphere, that lovely little cushion almost around us that keeps us warm, keeps us protected, keeps us breathing, and keeps us grounded. But without it, or if something changes about it in some major way, we may be in for a lot of trouble. If the pressure increases or decreases by not even that much, there would be massive repercussions for humanity. If the oxygen oxygen levels increased or decreased by, again, not even too much, there would be massive fatigue, death worldwide, increased rates of spontaneous combustion, and the atmosphere also keeps our planet at the right temperature for liquid water, which is a huge plus. I mean, I love liquid water personally, and the atmosphere of course protects us from deadly space lasers. So yeah, a tainted, damaged, compromised, or even non-existent atmosphere would very quickly become a problem for humanity. Fantastical uprising. So this one is kind of an alternate dimension takeover, but specifically in involving fantasy worlds, somehow getting access into our world, rising up and destroying humanity in the process. It's kind of a fun one, especially if you're into fantasy sort of things, and can maybe imagine Dungeons and Dragons style individuals, you know, like sword and shield, magic users, flooding into our reality and we have to fight them off, or even like some Lord of the Rings type creatures, which we would honestly probably quite easily lose to creatures like that. Like how are we fighting a fucking Balrog? You think that thing's going down with a few M16s? It's got a magic fucking whip. But this one is kind of a fun one and the possibilities are almost endless, so it makes for some great headcanon and imagination material. Cognitive Massacre. This describes the idea of a mental virus type thing spreading amongst humans through an image, a sound, a video, or even some other form of general media. Something like the ring might be a good example. Once you see the video, you're like doomed to die sort of thing. But there's an SCP entry that explores this idea quite well well, SCP-571. It's a super interesting read if you have the time, but the gist of it is that there is a complex pattern that once seen drives the person who saw it insane, and it compels them to immediately search for a paper, a piece of card, a wall, basically anything that it can draw on, and also search for a pen, pencil, marker, and basically draw out the super complex shape. And apparently, despite its insane complexity, the average human will copy it out accurately about 96% of the time. And once SCP-571 has been copied, the affected person will seek out other humans and try really hard to show them this pattern. Obviously everyone they show will get infected and try to copy the image, and then after they've copied the image, they will then go off and try and show other people. The entry says that attempts to reason with this person are met with complete failure, as they are basically taken over and their one goal is replicating this pattern and showing it to as many people as possible. And you can imagine if this thing gets loose, it 
it could basically take over the entire world. So a super creepy one and one that is basically unstoppable if it ever does get out. Unless you like completely barricade yourself from society I guess. But I am really digging these SCP entries and we will get into a few more of them a little further down the iceberg. Eldritch Invasion. So Eldritch technically is a word just meaning strange or eerie or sinister or ghostly. So it could be an invasion of Earth of ghosts, of ghouls, of goblins, no of just evil sorts of things. But over the years the word Eldritch has kind of become closely associated with Lovecraftian ideas and monsters and stories such as Cthulhu who we mentioned earlier. So I'll cover a few of the Lovecraftian entities as they just seem a little more cool. So if Cthulhu wasn't bad enough on his own there were also a bunch of other gods all with their own different powers and effects. These are often described and covered in what's known as the Cthulhu mythos which is a honestly huge collection of gods. Old gods, outer gods, primordial gods with a god known as Yogsoth essentially being the most powerful. Yogsoth is the embodiment of the very fabric of reality and the entirety of the space-time continuum so he'd likely be the most powerful being in the universe if it weren't for Azathoth. And Azathoth is an outer god who is currently asleep and that is very much a good thing. He is being lulled to stay in his slumber by his messenger playing music to him. And all of reality, all of existence, including the existence of all these other Cthulhu gods, everything is simply the dream of Azathoth. And so if he were ever to wake up, reality would cease to exist. He's also the ruler of all the other outer gods and is often seen as a symbol for pure primordial chaos. And it should be noted that a lot, if not all of these creatures, have physical forms that humans can't even comprehend. Kind of like imagining a new color, like you just can't physically even do that. And so anything you can imagine, any drawing of these gods, any depiction of them, isn't actually the gods, because it's physically impossible to even comprehend them. A bunch of the more terrifying evil bad guy gods are either asleep or have been imprisoned or hidden, like in mountains or under the ocean sort of thing, or even at the center of the earth. And if they ever woke up or got free and attacked us, we would be in big trouble. This is a super interesting mythos and universe that I would love to get into in like a full length video if enough people want to see it in the near future. Earth stops spinning. <sighs> Oh boy. So we've covered what happens when the core stops spinning. But what happens if the Earth just stops spinning altogether? Well, the Earth at the equator is spinning around at around 400 meters per second. So if it were to just suddenly stop, most of us would get flung at 400 meters per second to the east. Smashing into whatever tree or building or car or wall you happen to be in front of. Yeah, not very fun. But what if the stopping happened gradually? If this did happen, it wouldn't be as immediate immediately dramatic. We would notice our days and nights getting longer for one. Our weather patterns would get disrupted. A bunch of the technology we use, especially utilizing stuff in our atmosphere, would get disrupted. We would likely lose our Earth's magnetic field, which as we mentioned before would be quite problematic. And eventually Earth would actually become tidally locked to the sun. Just as the moon is now tidally locked to Earth, which means we only ever see one side of the moon, the sun would only ever see one side of the Earth, which would make the front side of the Earth in constant daylight and the back side of the Earth in constant darkness. Most life forms on the dark side would likely die out and anything on the bright side would find it just unbearably hot and bright. And if someone were writing a story for this, then humanity might possibly evolve to set up cities along the light dark barrier so you could maybe work in the light side in the daytime and then get a train to the other side of town where it's perpetually dark and just go home for the evening and sleep there. It'd be a pretty strange existence but it might make for a cool story I think so I give my blessings for someone to make it into a feature length film. Time collapse it's just the scenario that time simply stops working or collapses in some way. Either everything just freezes eternally or or, I don't know, existence just ceases to exist, or something like that, but we won't really be around to experience that, so 
who knows. And just to add to this, I just now had a really strange thought. So light, right, how we're able to see and detect everything is because light particles, photons, are just bouncing off things. Say this mug, they're bouncing off the mug and then into my eyes, where my eye picks it up, registers it as sight, and so we see the thing. But this is happening constantly, with light constantly bouncing in and out all around the room. But if we froze time, like we see in all these movies, where every Everyone's just like completely still. Wouldn't that also freeze like photons? So light wouldn't be traveling anymore? So since light isn't traveling, there's no light hitting our eyes. So surely everything should just go pitch black the moment we freeze time because we're not able to detect the light and i don't know the exact science behind that it's just something i thought of right now but i thought it was an interesting thought so let me know your thoughts down below hyper intelligent disease this just refers to a disease that is really clever somehow it constantly predicts any vaccines and treatments that are created for it and actively mutates itself in order to avoid those vaccines and treatments meaning that we can basically never fight this disease it knows the best best people to spread to to get optimal infection, it knows the perfect amount of people to kill, depending on its goal to reach as many people as possible, or to for some reason kill as many people as possible, and once a disease like this gets out, we are all well and truly screwed. The Infernal Purge. So the wording on this one is a little strange, but it basically refers to mass violence and mayhem worldwide. For some reason, whether it's a rabies-like virus, or eldritch influence, or an alien brain signal, or perhaps just Fred makes a return to the internet. Everyone is out in the streets, punching each other, stabbing each other, whacking each other with newspapers. Sheer and utter bloodshed, death and violence. Dimensional shattering. Imagine Doctor Strange and the multiverse, and you're more or less there. The barriers between multiple dimensions end up shattering and breaking, and things start to act oddly. Portals or gates soon appear, allowing travel to and from other dimensions. And then humanity as we know it will likely be over. Perhaps we all get killed by an interdimensional demon, or perhaps nothing whatsoever attacks us, and we all just end up exploring these dimensions, and all getting split up, and we can never reunite and form humanity again. Either way, humanity would be over. Thaumaturgic Revolution. So this one is a kind of fun idea. In this scenario, magic is discovered to be real. Either a regular human discovers the secret to magic and starts using it, or we discover magical people people like witches and wizards in the Harry Potter universe and then all hell breaks loose. It's magic users versus non-magic users, and guess who wins that battle? Not us, that's for sure. And if you know a bit about the Harry Potter lore, you'll know that this basically already happened, and that muggles actually used to have wars with witches and wizards, which is partly why the wizard folk have chosen to hide everything from the muggles, to basically stop these ongoing attacks and wars. But as I said, it's a pretty fun one. Rogue Reality Bender. Imagine, if you will, a world where someone randomly discovers, or through a demonic worship ritual or something, acquires the ability to bend reality. Perhaps they're of good intentions and they're able to control it well enough, but if they have bad intentions, or more likely if they're not able to control this new random power, they could in an instant warp and destroy reality, resulting in a fairly quick yet creative apocalypse. Digital pandemic. So this is a hypothetical, thank god, computer virus that is able to bypass all security measures and spread to not just computers but all technology whatsoever. So light bulbs, electric ovens, fridges, security systems, fucking Tamagotchis. It spreads worldwide and infects everything, leaving us with essentially useless bricks. Except it's even worse because not only can we not use the electronics, this crazy computer virus now has access to everything. So yeah, we are absolutely screwed. Tier 6, The Awakening. So we actually already referred to this one a little earlier on. This refers to the idea that in the Cthulhu mythos, the entirety of reality and the universe is all a dream of Azathoth. So if he ever wakes up, i.e. The Awakening, we, along with everything in existence, would cease to exist. But thankfully, someone is playing soothing tunes for him, probably like 
lo-fi beats or something. So for now, we're all good. Evaporation. So this one refers to a pretty interesting, eerie, creepypasta that describes all water on Earth basically evaporating. This includes rivers, seas, clouds, even bottled water, and sodas and sauces, except for, it seems, any water in any living beings. Like, you would still slowly get thirsty, but it just means like all the water in your body won't just immediately evaporate, as happened with all the other water on Earth. So this this creepypasta tells of how everyone basically went crazy. There was anarchy on the streets, everyone was getting thirsty, no one could find any water, and so one of the only ways of hydration that people found was in blood. So they started killing animals, drinking their blood, until they either ran out of animals or they weren't sufficient enough. So then people turned to humans, killing them and drinking their blood as a source of hydration. I won't spoil the ending and it is pretty creepy and eerie so do read it for yourself if you are interested but it is at least in my opinion quite a unique story so it is what it is quantum non-existence. So the quantum world is, to say the least, very strange, and we still don't fully understand it, like not even close. It often doesn't follow the laws of logic or the rules and ideas that we've successfully applied in our larger world. These just don't often apply to the quantum world in the same way. Quantum things can sometimes exist and not exist at the same time, exist in seemingly two different states at the same time. Information can travel faster than the speed of light and it's just really confusing and weird and quantum non-existence is basically the idea that randomly through some quantum reaction or fluctuation or something something might occur that perhaps starts a chain reaction which leads to the universe basically not existing i mean it's possible we have no idea how the universe or the quantum world works like not really and there would seem to be no reliable way to predict something like this and i don't know if us not knowing about about the end of the universe would make it less or more scary. I mean, maybe ignorance really is bliss. Mimetic pandemic. So firstly, we have to explain memes a little bit. I know it's insane explaining a meme, but let me ask you, what exactly is a meme? Like, how would you describe it? A funny image or video out of context that often has in context words? Sounds a bit wordy or boring, but a meme is basically an idea. It's an idea or concept that spreads throughout society, often in a virus-like way, through people and their interactions. It often has a sort of natural selection process to it, i.e. the memes that are the best become the most popular and are spread the most, i.e. something going viral, and the ones that aren't as good just simply die out. The term meme was actually invented, believe it or not, by biologist Richard Dawkins. This was in 1976 in his book The Selfish Gene, and soon after that the study of memes was created, which was called mimetics, and that's basically where it all came from. I swear to god I'm not making this up, I know it sounds insane but you can look it up for yourself, it is 100% how it all started. The word actually comes from the same root word for mimic, meaning basically to imitate, and the idea was that memes kind of well, imitate themselves, and they imitate ideas, and they spread around, so in duplicating themselves, it's kind of imitating themselves. It's kind of a loose connection, but that's kind of the idea that he was going for. And obviously when he created this, this was before the internet, so it wasn't like internet memes that he was referencing or that he had in mind, but it was more like little jingles that spread throughout society, common sayings or phrases, common ideas or what's acceptable in a certain society at a certain time. All of of these were, as Richard Dawkins said, memes. So that's just a little history of memes that I quite enjoyed when I found out about it. But a mimetic pandemic refers to an idea, a concept, a meme that spreads throughout all of humanity and leads to the eventual collapse of society. Maybe it's a belief, maybe it's a destructive mindset, but whatever it is, it spreads like wildfire, people get it stuck in their heads, it drives them insane, and society collapses. Necro society. So this is the idea that the afterlife, whatever that is, becomes packed or overcrowded or closed for some reason, and now the dead are forced to live on Earth. I can see this one going like one of two different ways, either the hilarious whimsical sitcom sort of way, where like your next door neighbor is now like a wacky skeleton man or something, or the living dead zombie eating your face apocalypse kind of way. Not very likely, but pretty cool as a concept, and also extremely terrifying. The flesh that hates. So this refers 
refers to an SCP. SCP-610. That is a strange, parasitic, deadly organism discovered in Russia. It basically latches onto and infects humans, causing them to slowly die, but not before urgently seeking out contact with other humans, which obviously further spreads the disease slash organism. After the host body dies, the host's organs and body will start up again at an accelerated pace and speed and actively try to chase after and make contact with other humans. Eventually, it'll slow down, settle down, and just start spreading itself out in all directions. So another great, super creepy SCP. And I really must cover a full list of these sometime in the future. When day breaks. So this is yet another SCP, which is just honestly fantastically well written. And once again, if you haven't already, go check it out. But this one is an SCP-001 proposal. Basically, no one knows what SCP-001 is, which is the first SCP ever discovered or captured. So there are always a bunch of proposed ideas for what it might be, and this is simply one of the proposals. Basically, in this proposal, SCP-001 is the sun, but more specifically, the sun after a certain event has occurred. This event results in the sunlight, actually melting people into like this amorphous goo but this goo still has the consciousness of what it was before and it just kind of blobs around doing like blob things and these different blobs can also blob together and become a bigger blob and there are now at this point these giant seas of creatures which is just one big blob basically of all of these melted people and animals and creatures all just blobbed into one with like random body parts and arms and stuff sticking out and these giant blobs basically act as one mind sort of thing and they can use their body parts and limbs sticking out of the blob it's like this really creepy writing but people hide underground in buildings pretty much anywhere to get away from this sunlight but eventually the goo finds them breaks through their defenses doesn't kill them but grabs them and slowly passes them up the goo up to the surface level where they expose them to the sunlight and turn them into goo and make them join the giant goo blob as i said it's an intense read and it goes into a fairly decent amount of detail and i just love this scp stuff forbidden knowledge is the idea that at some point in humanity, we will discover something, some knowledge we either don't want or aren't supposed to have. It'll spread through society, it'll drive us mad, and it'll eventually end to the collapse of society and humanity. Revenge of the Fae. This is just a scenario where the Fae, fairies, pixies, garden gnomes, all for whatever reason just decide they don't want to hide anymore, and they come out to take their revenge on humanity. They use their magic, their glitter, their well-known guerrilla tactics to attack and destroy humanity. It's kind of hard to say who would win in a fight like this, as, you know, we have the numbers and, well, the nukes, but they have magic and sparkles, so it might be a close fight. Absolute sterilization. What if, for whatever reason, humans and animals just became completely infertile? We could all live, we could all die just as normal, but we just couldn't have any more kids. This would result in the human population slowly declining, and there would also be major meat shortages, as we couldn't, you know, like, breed animals. So we'd all likely have to go vegan. Jesus, that might just be the scariest thing on this iceberg so far. This is a little extreme, but it's maybe close to being one of the more likely scenarios. Fertility rates are at an all-time low, after all, and perhaps there is some disease or mutation or something that spreads really easily and just makes people infertile, meaning it would wipe out the entire human population in just one generation, which is honestly a terrifying thought. You are still free to live your life perfectly normal, but with the knowledge that you will be among the last humans to ever exist. Metaphysical collapse. So I couldn't find much on this one, but I'm assuming this is just like the sudden collapse of the metaphysical, which is kind of like the collapse of information, meaning. Basically, the physical is stuff like this. Without naming it, we can touch it, we can measure it. It exists as a physical thing. But the metaphysical would be us calling it a mug, because mug isn't an inherent property of this. It's more like a description, an identity, if you will. It will pretty much always be this one thing physically, but it can be multiple things metaphysically. We can call it a mug, a cup, maybe it's a type of a bowl, maybe if you're really strange it's a spoon or a ladle or a hat if I 
turn this upside down and spill my tea. So I guess a metaphysical collapse would be a collapse where all meaning just ceases to exist. Maybe we just all go brain dead and forget what anything is and what it's used for, which would be pretty eerie and terrifying, honestly. But I am still calling this a mug. Consecutive CP symmetry violations. So this is quite a complex and sciencey one, but it's basically the idea that there is an inherent balance in the universe between particles and antiparticles, and that if that balance is ever disturbed at all anywhere in the universe, it could ignite a chain reaction that ends with the entire universe exploding or disappearing into nothingness. Scary stuff, but from what I can see, you probably need a master's degree to fully understand this one. And and I don't have one of those, so moving on. Krampus Crisis. So Krampus is sort of like an evil Santa, sort of. He originated in the Alpine region of Europe, so France, Italy, that sort of area. And he traditionally accompanied Saint Nick, or Santa Claus, into children's homes, and while Saint Nick would reward the good kids with presents and candy, Krampus would punish the bad kids, hitting them with a stick and basically scaring the shit out of them. And I mean, this is a pretty terrifying individual, if I'm honest. But I think we need to bring him back. We have the good cop side of Christmas, but no bad cop side anymore. Like what, if you're naughty, you just don't get presents? Like, big deal. But if your parents threatened you with being jump scared by a literal fucking goat demon, I think more kids would honestly behave themselves. But this apocalypse is basically the idea that Krampus is real, and he goes on a rampage attacking and killing all the little ones until our entire species dies out. So, yeah, maybe don't bring him back. Tier 7, the death of information. So I don't think this one is referring to the death of universal information, like in a black hole, which is a very complex topic which I won't get into at the moment, but I think it's referring to the death of human information, like lost knowledge, that sort of thing. Either through a failure to upkeep communications, or through a nuclear war that destroys all records, books, digital storage, databases, and with all human knowledge gone and basically reset back to zero, humanity is kind of gone. Every mathematical equation we've figured out, we've got to go figure it out again. Every new invention we've made or element we've discovered, we've got to do that all again. It's a really strange and terrifying thought when you consider just how much knowledge we've built up as a species and how much our current new inventions rely on discoveries made before us. Like, not too long we just had, like, sticks and stones. And now I'm talking into a piece of glass that has, like, electricity for flowing through it somehow, and I'm recording the sound and the visuals, then what, later I'll edit it and that'll go up into space somehow, and then shoot down and all of you guys will just receive it again somehow from space? Like, what the fuck? This is nuts. If we lost all of this knowledge, I would have no clue how to do any of this. But the way we got here is bit by bit, slowly over time, climbing up this ladder, and this apocalypse is basically talking about destroying all the rungs and knocking us down to the bottom. So, yeah, it wouldn't be a fun world. Timeline entanglement. So this may have well just been straight out of a Marvel film. Imagine multiple universes. The multiverse, if you will. If you had a single item in multiple timelines, or perhaps two timelines interacting in a way that wasn't proper, becoming entangled or intertwined, this could cause some messy events, potentially even ending one or both of the timelines. Timelines and time travel is always a fun one to think about about, as because I mentioned before, it tends to be more science fiction than actual science, and so the possibilities are kind of endless, but it is always a fun one to consider and think about. Grandma Apocalypse. Oh boy, this is now a massive time sink. So while researching this one, I of course searched Google for Grandma Apocalypse, and with this search, I stumbled across a little game called Cookie Clicker. I am now addicted to this game. That was a week ago, and I am still addicted and I'm slightly annoyed at how good this game is and how easily I got roped in considering it's just a game where you collect and make cookies. But God damn, it is addictive. But the grandma apocalypse is when these lovely little cookie baking grandmas that you buy and collect over the course of the game eventually become or rather reveal their true form. These fleshy grandma demons intent on destroying the entire world and baking evil cookies, which is what? 
like vegan cookies. So yeah, that's the Grandma Apocalypse. Not a super serious one, but the addictiveness of this game is probably the most terrifying thing about it. Bonus entry, the nine billion names of God. So this is a reference to a short story by the same name, written by Arthur C. Clarke, the same guy who wrote 2001 Space Odyssey. This story is short, and you can read it yourself in like less than five minutes, which I would highly recommend as it is a fantastic read. But it basically tells the story of this guy who sells these automatic printing machines to this Tibetan monastery. He questions them about why they'd want the machines, and they say that they want to print out the nine billion names of God. And he's kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. So these monks believe that man's purpose is to discover and write down the nine billion names that God has. And instead of just waiting for chance and for humanity to stumble upon these, these monks want to basically hard force and accelerate the process. And their goal is to write or print out every permutation of name possible up to nine letters long. And once all possible names have been printed, that'll basically be our purpose done and God will turn off the universe. So first they try AAA, 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 then they'd write down AAA, AAA, AAB, and then C, and then D, etc. And they've been doing this for like 300 years, and they estimate it'll take them a few thousand years to complete by hand, which is why they're getting these automatic printing machines. There are billions, potentially trillions of possibilities available, depending on exactly what rules you set for this, and it only actually takes the monks three months to complete this using these machines with the doctor at the end who is away from the monks by this point saying I wonder if the computer has finished its run it was due now with the final line in the short story being overhead without any fuss the stars were going out I really do like this one the end this isn't the end of the video this is the name of one of the entries which is a creepy terrifying creepy pasta. I don't know why I keep describing creepy pastas as creepy. I mean, it's kind of implied in the name. But this creepy pasta says that if you go to any mental hospital, any mental institute, any halfway house in any country in the world and ask to visit someone who calls themselves the holder of the end, you will be taken to a deep dark secret hallway where you can hear these incoherent mutterings of someone in a cell. If you ever hear these mutterings stop, you are told to immediately utter the phrase, I am just passing through, I wish to talk. And if you still hear silence, then just run. Keep running and don't stop. Don't even sleep. The text says, just sleep wherever you happen to collapse. And when you wake up, you'll know whether you made it away or not. But if you do hear a response, you can approach the cell and see the person inside the cell cradling an unknown item and muttering in this unknown language. They will respond to one question and one question only. What happens when they all come together? And then the person will explain in terrifying detail what exactly happens when they all come together. And apparently this knowledge is so horrific that many people either check out immediately or disappear or go crazy themselves upon hearing it. And if you so much as just glance down at the item they're holding, your life will end brutally and painfully at their hands right there in that cell. The text ends with that object is one of 538. They must never come together, ever anti-memetic pandemic. So we covered the memetic pandemic, but the anti-memetic pandemic is kind of an interesting spin on it. A meme is something, an idea, a piece of knowledge that spreads around, it goes viral, everyone's heard of it sort of thing, but an anti-memetic pandemic would involve people forgetting everything, and that forgetting going viral and spreading amongst everyone. Everyone slowly starts forgetting who they are, their names, what they're doing, where they are. It would essentially be worldwide accelerated dementia and it would be completely devastating. The Shy Guy is another SCP and I honestly love these. This is SCP-096 and it's contained in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter cell. This cell has no cameras or viewing holes and this creature is described as humanoid, roughly two and a half meters in height with very little muscle mass and grossly disproportionate 
disproportionately long arms. It is pale and hairless, has white eyes, and can open its jaw up to four times what a regular human can. There are weight and laser sensors in the cell, so they can track where the shy guy is without actually looking. And the reason for this type of security is that if anyone looks at the shy guy's face, whether that's in person or through a video or through a photo, it will cover its face, scream and cry, and then after a minute or so, it will run towards the person that looked at it between 35 kilometers per hour and an unknown maximum speed, which it's been redacted on the uh, documents. But it doesn't matter how far away or where the viewer is, nothing has yet been discovered that is capable of stopping this creature once someone has seen it. And when it reaches the person, it will proceed to kill and likely consume them. Again, that part's also been redacted. And then it will calm down, regain its composure, become docile again, and slowly try and make its way back to its natural habitat. It says in the file notes that due to just how incredibly dangerous a chain reaction from this creature would be, one of the doctors in charge petitioned for the immediate termination of SCP-096, and he was actually approved for it, with the termination to be carried out at a scheduled date, but that date has been redacted, so we don't know if it's already happened, or if it's going to happen, or how far into the future it's going to happen. So a super interesting and creepy one, and did I mention I love these SCPs? I think I may have once or twice. Bonus entry, Kalki reincarnation of Vishnu. So in Hinduism, there are these main gods or supreme beings, and one of these gods is Vishnu. Now, occasionally when mankind is in a rut or we're screwing things up in some way, Vishnu will come down to earth in the form of a avatar or incarnation, and these lesser gods are essentially the incarnations of Vishnu. Which brings us to Kalki. He is the 10th and final incarnation of Vishnu, and he appears at the end of this period of sin and chaos and mayhem to basically wipe existence to a clean slate and restart a new cycle of time. Hindus believe that there are these four periods of time, the first one being like perfect and amazing and blissful, the next one being slightly less good than that, and so on and so on until the fourth one, which is the Kali Yuga, filled with violence and sin and conflict, and it's also the one that we are currently in right now. The Kali Yuga began 5,000 years ago and has roughly another 426,000 years left, so we still got a bunch of time, but at this point, Kalki will come down to Earth, start the universe fresh again in the Satya Yuga, which is the super blissful first stage, and the cycle will just continue from there. So, some interesting stuff. New Sphere Contamination. So the New Sphere, just like the Biosphere and the Atmosphere, is an area with new meaning knowledge or the mind, and sphere meaning sphere, but it's used to describe basically all of human knowledge. But not just human knowledge, human reasoning, human emotions, like what it is to be a human. All of those sorts of things are described in the new sphere. So what if all that were contaminated? We touched on a few topics similar to this earlier on, but it kind of reminds me of stuff like old religions or old cultures. When like an invading army came in, say to invade the Celts or something, after a while the Celts forgot who the Celtic gods were. They forgot their names, they forgot their own languages, their appearances, their stories, the knowledge of them completely. And so that's what you can imagine for something like this. So it wouldn't be religion or necessarily culture that we're losing, but somehow if we get invaded by aliens or AI or humanity just breaks down, we may kind of slowly or suddenly lose what it means to be human. Our philosophies, our reasoning, our histories, how we should kind of act. And that is a little sad and and slightly terrifying, but I think we're okay for now. Liminal gateways. So liminal basically just means threshold or in-between thresholds. Like when you're a middling teenager and you're not quite a child, you're not quite an adult, you're like stuck in the gap between worlds. And this is basically what liminal gateways are. They are gateways to liminal worlds, these strange, eerie dimensions, worlds, realities, universes that have kind of a uncanny valley feeling 
feeling about them. They're kind of recognizable and familiar, but not really. They're kind of comforting, but also kind of creepy and eerie at the same time. There's something terrifying and creepy about them, but it's not like jump scares or full terror, like a haunted house, spider webs, that sort of thing. It's like this eerie sense of dread, and it's explored really well in some analog horrors, like the back rooms, for example. And I guess the idea of this is that some of these liminal gateways will open and consume or trap humans in these other realms. Or the normal amount of gateways will open. I mean, I don't know what the normal amount of demonic liminal gateways would be, but the normal amount would open, except this time maybe someone brings something back with them through the liminal gateway. Something sinister, something destructive, kind of like the upside down in Stranger Things. Scary to think about, and I will be covering the back rooms at some point in the future, as it's always seemed just a super fascinating thing to cover for me. But anyway, moving on. Now I don't know if this is OK class or Omega K class, because it's technically the Omega symbol, but let's just go with the Omega class scenario, which is a scenario that, for whatever reason, no creature on Earth can die anymore, like at all. They can still feel pain, they can still be injured, they can still get diseases, and they can still bleed, break bones, lose limbs, and get old. But while none of these injuries or diseases is ever cured or fixed, they also can never die from them. And so eventually with no one dying, the world will just be a hellish landscape filled with disease and pain and suffering. You'd keep every single cut you ever got and constantly bleed from them. This is just a super terrifying thought. And honestly, one of the worst ways for humanity to go. And also, also, it's part of the SCP universe, so of course it's fantastic. Retro causal erasure. So this one is a pretty cool idea. So you can imagine time in the past, for some reason, starts to decay or change, and we won't see or notice it because it's in the past. But if you go off the one timeline theory, then changes in the past will change our present. Kind of like in Back to the Future, when Marty's arm starts to disappear. We wouldn't know what changes in the past had occurred, or what the past changes would mean for the present. But it would just be mayhem, with countless things going in and out of existence, people disappearing, new people appearing, it would just be madness. So a terrifying thing to experience, but a pretty fun one to explore and think about. The Holiest Wars. This describes a scenario where God dies or disappears, and for whatever reason, jealousy, rage, boredom, the angels wage a war on humanity, with no god to rein them in or to save us. Pretty epic idea, and I think it might make a cool book series, but if I'm being honest, I think the angels probably win that one. Bonus entry, Apep swallows the sun. So this is the Egyptian belief that Apep, the ancient spirit of darkness, would every night launch an attack on Ra, the sun god. He was, as many figures of chaos and evil are, depicted as a snake, and would hypnotize Ra and all of his followers, ambushing Ra's boat, and swallowing him whole, plunging the world into darkness. Then Set would pierce the snake with a great spear, injuring Apep, and releasing Ra, bringing light back to the world. The idea is that this goes on every single night, and if the other gods ever fail to free Ra, the entire world would be plunged into eternal darkness, and it would be the end of life as we know it. Pretty epic. The Battle Cats. And I think this is another game I'm getting addicted to. Please make it stop. The Battle Cats is a game involving cats. These cats are all shapes and sizes, as you can see here. Like, literally, look at some of these fucking cats. The idea is that somehow, perhaps through an interdimensional portal or something, these battle cats enter our real world and take over, and because they are just so dang cute, we would be unable to stop them. Bit of a fun entry to mix things up, but the next entry is the third rupture. Now, I don't know what the third rupture term is exactly referring to, but the notes on the iceberg says that it refers to Half-Life 3, which was an unreleased, undeveloped game that's become something of a meme in the past decade. Everyone was saying Valve should have made this game, should have released it, coming up with theories about why they didn't make it or why they didn't release it. Either it was so good it would just end humanity with how good it was, or it was so bad that it would end humanity, or there was some secret knowledge in it or something. And they're fun theories and they can be a little bit silly, but this scenario is basically saying that if and when Half-Life 3 is released, it will be too much for everyone 
everyone, causing a third rupture and ending humanity. As I said, a little bit silly, a little bit memey, quite fun. But our next entry is anything but silly. ZK class scenario. So we once again return to my favorite part of the internet, the SCP archives. K class scenarios are hypothetical situations that could have a drastic effect on reality, including but not limited to the end of the world. Now these scenarios are even further divided by these additional letters. So AK class scenarios, for instance, are related to mass madness. CK class scenarios are related to history or reality being changed. SKs involve another species or civilization, surpassing humanity as the dominant species on Earth, while ZK class scenarios are the last on the list, and they result in one of the most extreme effects, which is the fundamental breaking or elimination of reality itself. So yeah, you don't want to fuck with these types of scenarios, and they're all kept as secure as possible to obviously prevent any unwanted events or scenarios. So fingers crossed we don't run into any of these anytime soon. Simulation corruption. So way, way earlier in the iceberg, we discussed simulation shutdown, where our reality, if it were a simulation, were shut down and simply ceased to exist. Well, this one is a little more nuanced than that. It's still the same situation, we're still living in a simulation, except instead of it just being shut down, it is corrupted or glitched in some way. So maybe it malfunctions or even gets a computer glitch like we actually do in real life and instead of just shutting down we experience strange breaks in reality maybe gravity randomly stops working cars glitch into walls people randomly teleport and disappear all over the place anything can happen in a computer glitch so while it might not be as bad as a simulation shutdown at least in the short term it'd probably be a lot worse in the long term as i'm guessing we would just go insane with everything changing so radically like that but who knows maybe it'd be like activating cheat codes or something ESO physical disruption. So you're either gonna love me or hate me, but this is another entry involving the SCP universe, and it is super interesting. ESO physics is the study of physical embodiments of concepts. It's a little hard to explain. For instance, normally things exist because a concept of them exists, but with ESO physics, the concepts exist because the thing exists, which I know makes no fucking sense. But one example is death or the concept of death, or the reality of death, like things dying, only exists because there is an otherworldly creature that exists somewhere out there who is the embodiment of death. Except it's not the embodiment of death, because remember things kind of work the other way around. It's more like death and things dying is the embodiment of this creature, like the creature came first, and there's a constant connection to the creature. So if the creature stopped existing, death throughout the universe would cease to be a thing. The same is true with happiness, with life, and it's a really strange, insane way of thinking that is honestly pretty fun and quite scary, but it's definitely up there with my top things in the SCP universe, which I mean, let's be honest, pretty much everything in the SCP universe is my favorite by this point. Universal Paperclips. So this is a reference to a fun little online game that's not quite as fun as Cookie Clicker, thank god, but the idea is to make as many paperclips as possible, and by the end of the game you can develop this AI that, if it succeeds, eventually makes the entire universe into paperclips. And that's just how it ends. Pretty hilarious, pretty insane, probably pretty terrifying if you're afraid of paperclips, but also a reminder of the dangers, once again, of AI. So yeah, just use staples from now on, I guess. Pataphysical collapse. So if you thought esophysics was complex, just wait until you hear about pataphysics. I mean, it's not even that complex. It's basically like where science is the study of reality, pataphysics is like the study of the imaginary. The idea and concept of it started in the 1900s as sort of a mockery of science, kind of a parody sort of thing, where it had vague scientific sounding sort of solutions and theories, and people were basically just making shit up, but that was kind of by design, as this form of science was supposed to make a parodic mockery of the real science. And uh, I just looked it up, parodic isn't a word apparently? Okay, how dare you tell me this is not a word. I hereby from this day invent the word parodic and declare that it is an actual word. So pataphysics later became known as the study of the imaginary, because as I said, a lot of the rules and solutions were basically imaginary, they were just made up. But then 
then if you think about it, imaginary stuff is kind of real in a way. And then it starts to get really weird from here. One example, again from the lovely SCP, is SCP-3143, which is a fictional entity. It's fictional, but with the ability to collapse reality into its narrative. So what does the SCP do to combat this? Well, they can't interact with it because it's fictional. So they create a fictional department of the SCP, along with fictional employees, and try to take control of the narrative, which is they basically just write SCP fanfics and post them online. And in these fanfics is the story about how they caught this fictional entity. And the result was the fictional entity was caught and contained. If this sounds kind of hard to imagine, once again, pun intended. Think about it this way. When you're a kid and one of your friends shoots an imaginary fireball at you, what do you do? You block it with a imaginary shield. Only imaginary things can block other imaginary things. It's the same as if you have a character in a story. Say you've written a bad guy and you want to kill this bad guy. How do you kill him? You can't just stab the pages physically. You have to attack them with another fictional character. So you write in a hero and in the story the hero then goes and defeats the bad guy and you're defeating fiction with fiction. It's a very very interesting one to think about but I think overall this entry is referring to if we are stories or rather the story of a great entity or god writing out our universe and if this entity ever stops writing or changes the story then we might very well cease to exist. God looks the other way so there's not much to go on for this one but I'm assuming it's kind of the same idea as God has forsaken us. He no longer answers prayers or fights on our behalf. Temptations, the devil, demons, all run free and amok, and we are left basically to fend for ourselves. Eventually, I'm assuming without God's help, we lose the good fight, and Satan takes over the kingdom of Earth. I mean, that's probably how it would go anyway. Mass Knowledge Event. So this one is kind of similar to other previous entries, but not exactly. We've covered mass forgetting, the viral permutation of a single idea, spreading through humanity, but what if that viral permutation was every possible concept and idea ever? What if it spread throughout humanity and suddenly we knew all things, every detail, every experience, every possibility, to the point where life would just become meaningless? It'd be like watching a film you've already watched 50 billion times. And you've probably heard it a bunch, but I honestly think that is partly what makes us humans. Like the famous quote, to err is human. In making mistakes, in taking risks, in being flawed, we are being human. And if we knew everything about every everything always. I think existence would lose all of its meaning and worth extremely quickly, and honestly that would probably be the end of it. Eighth tier, reverse rapture. So this is an interesting one to think about. So in the regular rapture, which we covered way back, God comes down and then brings all the believers up to heaven with him. But in this concept of reverse rapture, somehow the real best world, the afterlife, is revealed to all humans, like unequivocally. And so people are so desperate desperate to send themselves there, that they start en masse sending themselves there, if you know what I mean. So instead of God zooping people up there, people will just be zooping themselves up there. Pretty strange kind of unique, but absolutely upsetting and terrifying if something like this actually did happen. The final dogma. This refers to the scenario where all gods, all beliefs, and all faiths are combined into one. Whether that's by force or whether that's by a one true god coming out and revealing themselves to every human being. But this wouldn't necessarily destroy the earth or destroy humanity, but it would likely, I think, cause massive wars between people and religious sects, claiming that this new single god is like a false god or a demon or something and there'd probably be no super effective way to tell if this god or dogma was real which would probably further divide humanity. Divine Decay. Boy these are getting pretty dark now. Divine Decay refers to an event in which god dies and his body just starts to decay and rot into monstrosities beyond comprehension. These monstrosities then proceed to fall down to earth and attack us and destroy humanity and this is a very dark very obscure but 
still fairly unique concept. And uh, with a lot of these, I hope someone has actually written a story about them. It would make for a pretty interesting read. Tulpa Invasion. So a tulpa is a thought form or artificial being created through the power of the mind by, depending on the version of belief, people who have either meditated for sustained periods of time or have mastered some form of mental ancient magic. It's created by the mind and imagination, if you will, and then is either self-sustained, so the person can just stop thinking about it and it still exists, or it is sustained through the power of the mind and willpower of the individual. So a tulpa invasion would be a bunch of these things, all imagined into reality. The most creepy, powerful things we can, well, imagine, literally, all come to life and all come to overthrow humanity and kill us all, which, can I first say, rude. Like, we create you from our own hearts and minds, and this is how you repay us? Honestly, the nerve of these creatures. Unhinged realm. The sun finally opens its eye. It reveals other dimensions and realms. Mankind goes mad by being exposed to them. Maybe we get invaded by interdimensional demons. The end. Philosophical zombie apocalypse. So this describes a zombie apocalypse, except they're not actual zombies, at least not outwardly, but they're creatures Creatures that claim to be humans, but are actually mindless beings without consciousness who slowly take over the world. Pretty creepy, and it is kind of like a zombie invasion, except the zombies are wearing human skins and don't even necessarily eat human flesh, but rather you can say eats our emotions or our minds by being so manipulative, stupid, selfish. And I'm sure there's some merit in saying that something like this is kind of already happening, but I wouldn't go quite that far just yet. Simulation Takeover. So this is the third in the trilogy of these simulation theories. Simulation Shutdown, Simulation Corruption, and now Simulation Takeover. This is the, in my opinion, super creepy idea of humans creating a simulation of sorts, and then that simulation fighting back against us, and eventually killing us, taking over the real world, and yeah, extremely weird and terrifying. Like imagine you create create a video game, and then the video game characters start like randomly talking back to you, and then they climb out of the computer screen. Like there's gotta be some uncanny valley type of stuff happening around this idea. Pretty cool one, but creepy nonetheless. Those which are not. We discover a realm of non-existence, where everything that never existed, that doesn't exist, that will never exist, exists. Yeah, wrap your head around that one. Things that are not can't be. You can't have fucking nothing isn't everything is, but in this scenario either a creature, concept, or situation escapes from the realm, which causes unspeakable either physical damage to our reality, or just conceptual damage if the mere existence of a thing that cannot exist is in our reality, maybe the whole universe just rips apart and ceases to exist. But at least it won't not be the worst thing you've not never experienced. The giants awaken. Wendigoon! We got giants. Hey, someone tell Wendigoon there's, there's, there's giants. This kind of combines Wendigoon's belief in giants with his love of the monument mythos, proposing that giants do exist and are not dead, but rather are sleeping in monuments, in mountains, in hills, in the ocean. And when they awaken, they will cause irreparable damage, destroying society and causing chaos everywhere. So much so that we revert back to primitive times, which would be a giant pain. But I'm and God's fury hath no end. This is where the Earth's temperatures rise by one degree Celsius every day, which is a really subtle kind of threat, but it is horrific when you think about it. So the Earth's at an average of what, like 15 degrees? Kind of 10 to 20 sort of range? So after just a month, we'd be coming up on the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. And after two months, that would be a pretty horrible way to exist. Unless we built like giant refrigeration machines or like just put aircon everywhere. But I don't know how this demon spell would work on our temperature or if it would even allow AC. So I don't know if that would even fix it. Mathematical failure scenario. This is a bizarre and interesting concept slash scenario where a new number say is discovered between four and five. Not a decimal like 4.1 or 4.5 or even four and a third, four and a half. Like I'm talking a literal whole number. Like imagine our numbers just went four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. Imagine that was completely normal and we were 
were all completely used to that and we built our systems and machines and formulas and theories based on that and then someone comes along and they discover eight this random pesky little new number between seven and nine it's kind of absurd kind of nonsensical as it's like trying to imagine a brand new color or something it's like you just can't do it but the idea is we discover this random whole number somewhere and then we need to throw out all of our maths all of our science all of our technology because it doesn't compute with this new number so that would lead to a second dark age essentially pretty wild idea but definitely unique. The hatching is the idea that our planet is an egg for some giant creature or god, and once it starts hatching, even before any of the earth actually breaks, the vibrations would just cause immense tremors that would result in world-ending earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, and of course once this egg fully hatches, uh, I mean, I don't even need to tell you what would happen. But this idea has been explored quite a few times in various medias. One recent one being the Eternals film, which was extremely disliked for some reason. I don't know why I quite like the film. But in the film, we find out that Earth is actually an egg for a celestial who is basically in the center of our Earth called Tiamat. I won't spoil the ending in case you haven't watched it, but it is a pretty fun concept. Furry War is the silly idea that furries, these guys, will start to outnumber us and take over the world. So so yeah, moving on. Early universal birth is the theory that says randomly by sheer chance another universe might bang into existence right beside Earth. Now since this is purely theoretical, not even that, it's like fantastical. It's unsure how this would affect Earth exactly. Would it be the same size as our universe? Essentially just acting like a giant bomb, expanding and blowing the Earth to smithereens? I like that word. It's a it's a good word. Smithereens. Or would it be a tiny universe? Like in that one Freezer episode of Love, Death and Robots? Or in that one Rick and Morty episode? Would we be able to go and observe it and maybe even eventually shrink ourselves down and enter it? Who knows? But it is definitely something that I have personally personally thought about over the years and the idea of us just being a tiny universe within someone else's universe is an idea that has kept me up for many many nights. EWW. So as with a lot of these entries there's not too much to go on. EWW basically stands for Emu World War which let me add some backstory to this. So in real life after World War One tons of these Australian veterans were given farmland for free in Western Australia and they were of course instructed to make the land good, start a farm on it, have a family, that sort of thing. But after a while, when they started growing crops, they found that a fucking army of 20,000 emus all migrated to their farmlands and just started destroying their crops. So eventually the Australian government sent out troops there and handed out guns to fight in, as the media called it, the emu war. They killed almost a thousand emus in the war, which had basically no impact on the emu population as a whole, and that was basically the end of it. So the idea is perhaps that the emus won so easily against Australia that they might at some point try and take over the world and then we need to fight back against them and then we have an emu world war which is absurd or that mankind might preemptively declare war on all emus worldwide which is equally absurd so yeah take this as you will you wake up Ah, the essential literary device for budding 12-year-old writers. This is the classic awful literary device of having a character, sometimes or often the narrator, wake up and kind of undoing the last X amount of things that have happened in the story. Whether that's an entire chapter of a book or an entire season of a show like in Dallas. And it's kind of like the literary duct tape for bad writing. You made a mistake? Just slap it on there. It'll hold it together barely, but it won't look too pretty. This idea is obviously regarding you, the viewer, in this universe. One day you wake up and find yourself in a new world, and this new world is in fact the real world. You were just asleep this whole time, and the earth, the sun, the universe were in, your Netflix account, your friends, your family, your League of Legends rank, that was all just an elaborate, incredibly lifelike dream, conjured up by you while you were taking a nap on a sunny day in this real universe. Kind of a scary thought to be honest. It's not gruesome or violent or even traditionally scary but just the possibility, the idea that everything in existence that you know could be made up and could be a dream is honestly 
at least to me, a little bit terrifying. The most annoying song in the world. So this one is kind of similar to the Mimetic Pandemic, except this is specifically about a song that spreads throughout humanity and basically drives everyone insane. Imagine a song, impossibly catchy, one that people can't stop singing, can't stop humming, and it just drives them mad. And it's super annoying, so anyone who hears it just wants to punch them in the face and haven't we got this already? But it would completely break down and disrupt humanity, society, and it would probably be number one in the charts till like the heat death of the universe. A hey, callbacks. The ninth tier, Brazil. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this one is just like a massive inside joke or something. Like the idea that everyone and everything will move to Brazil and it'll collapse humanity. Or that Brazil just gets really strong and destroys humanity. Or something like that, I don't really know. It's kind of a bit of a silly meme one and it's the only one in this tier so yeah and my lovely folks that is all we have time for i am currently dying and i need to get a lemsip or something but i do hope you enjoyed the video it was a ton of fun to research this one and as always guys thanks for watching